Pope Francis is admitted to Jamelli Hospital for a sudden respiratory condition. What is the state of the Pope's health? Meanwhile, more news from the Synodal Path this week. What changes are being called for now? The Papal Posse, Father Gerald Murray and Robert Royal are here with an analysis of these stories and many more the world over. Begins right now. Now, Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. If you'd like to send us a comment, I'm at Raymond Arroyo on Twitter. Send me a comment. Keep it clean. But first to the big story of the week. Pope Francis admitted to Gemelli Hospital in Rome Wednesday after suffering from what the Vatican at first called a respiratory infection. Initially, the Holy See said the Pope had gone to the hospital on Wednesday for a scheduled checkup. But Italian media was soon reporting that the Pope had arrived at Gemelli in an ambulance after canceling a TV interview at the last minute. The 86-year-old pope has had a history of health issues. He had part of his lung removed in his 20s while in seminary in Argentina, also due to a respiratory infection. And in 2021, he underwent surgery to remove a section of his colon after being diagnosed with diverticulitis. We'll continue to monitor the situation and discuss its potential ramifications with my next guests, the papal posse, editor-in-chief of the CatholicThing.org, Robert Royal, and canon lawyer and priest of the Archdiocese of New York, Father Gerald Murray. Thank you both for being here. Um, before we get to so many other issues, and I have a lot to discuss, I do want to spend a few moments on the Holy Father's health, his condition. The Daily Mail in the UK reported earlier that they were treating the Holy Father for pneumonia, which would fit with this respiratory infection that was originally acknowledged. The latest press release from the Vatican on Thursday states the following. Pope Francis spent the afternoon at Gemelli dedicating himself to rest, prayer, and some work duties in the context of clinical checks scheduled for the Holy Father. An infectious bronchitis was found, which required the administration of an antibiotic therapy on an infusion basis, which produced the expected effects with a clear improvement in the state of health. Based on the predictable outcome, the Holy Father could be discharged in the next few days. Um, Matteo Bruni, who's the Vatican spokesman, also said that the Holy Father read a few newspapers, went back to work. Of course, we are encouraging people to pray for the Pope. Uh, he had communion uh, at Mass, uh, prayed in a chapel. Um, I, gentlemen, I want to ask you, first of all, um, I mean, it looks like the Pope will be there for a few days. We don't know if he'll be able to take part in Easter services. We'll, we'll see. How serious is this situation from all you're hearing from your sources in the Vatican? And what impact, if any, um, will this have on the Pope's work, his agenda, his vision? Well, Raymond, it's, of course, a shock when we hear the Pope's been taken by ambulance to the hospital. I'm gl glad the reports are that the treatment is working. Bronchitis, of course, is nothing to uh, laugh about. It's a serious problem, so I'm glad he's being treated. Uh, we've heard that he's not going to celebrate the Holy Week ceremonies, that he's designated different Roman cardinals to do that. And that only makes sense, because after a hospitalization, uh, you need to rest back at home. So uh, given the Pope's vigorous work schedule, uh, I think he's going to have to spend a little bit of time now more resting, sleeping, uh, Eating properly, of course, that's always uh, something that, uh, you know, you want to cover something that really is a knock to your system, such as bronchitis. So I'm praying for him, mm -hmm. uh, keeping him in mind, and ask all the viewers to do the same. Mm -hmm. Bob, that shot of the Pope when he was getting onto the Pope mobile, he did look really uh, yeah. terrible in that shot. Um, uh, that seems to be near the moment where he realized something was up here. And then I guess his health advisor called an ambulance. They took him to uh, Jamelli Clinic. Your thoughts on this, on what we're seeing unfold here? And, you know, I, I always worry because the media rushes, you know, they, they, they start to watch and think something's going to happen imminently. And as I told so many people yesterday, calm down, probably just, you know, uh, a, a minor bump in the road. But your thoughts on this, Bob? Well, he's 86 years old, and, and so anything of a serious nature in this it is a fairly serious situation that seems to have 
uh, been gotten under control right away. But, you know, the Italian press very early on pointed out that he had had the general audience on, on Wednesday. He seemed to be very vigorous and fine. He went back to have lunch and was supposed to have the scheduled TV interview. And then he started experiencing chest pain. So I'm sure that is the that and that was actually the term that they used in, in the Italian press, chest pain. So mm -hmm. I'm sure they right away figured maybe there's a the, there's a uh, cardiac uh, situation here that's causing the difficulty mm -hmm. in breathing. So they rushed him to the hospital. Fortunately, that seems not to be the case right now. And I'm sure that they're looking very carefully at at all his vital signs along the way. But you know we have to recognize that he's an elderly man. He's had. He's had a knee problem. He's had this colon problem that you mentioned earlier. And all these things are, are very serious. And we've got to already begin to start thinking about what is it going to mean when we have the transition to the next papacy. Hmm. Uh, I want to move on to uh, the case of Father Hans Zollner. Uh, he's a leading safeguarding expert. He just resigned from this Pontifical Commission for the Protection of Minors, saying that there's, quote, urgent and structural and practical issues that led him to disassociate himself from this papal commission. Now, a member of the commission since its inception in 2014, Father Zollner submitted his resignation to the pope. That was accepted. In his written public uh, statement, Father Zollner said the following. Um, and this, he's particularly concerned about the need for urgent addressing in the areas of responsibility, compliance, accountability, and transparency. Lastly, I am aware of any regulations or unaware of any regulations that govern the relationship between the Commission and the dicastery for the doctrine of the faith, since the Commission was placed within the dicastery last June. Now, uh, you know, uh, Father Jerry, it's always very hard to figure out what people are really trying to say at times at the Vatican. Uh, it seems here he's worried about both the structure, the way this, this um, Commission was structured, and two other people resigned just last year from this commission for similar reasons. What's going on there? Why is he resigning at this point? He's obviously dissatisfied, Raymond, with the nature of what the committee's doing, how they're doing it. He mentioned sort of administrative issues regarding personnel and, and accounting for funds. But I think the more important issue is precisely that, the word transparency. You know, right now, this commission is largely of an educational nature. It doesn't really have power. Mm. Uh, to uh, enforce decisions. Uh, the judgment of sexual abuse cases involving minors and vulnerable adults goes to the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. So they're the ones charged with it. But then, you know, that has both an administrative and a judicial aspect. This is all, you know, canonical details that most people don't are familiar with. But essentially, the number of cases from out the world is overwhelming. They go to the Doctrine of the Faith. Uh, they're resolved or not. Uh, now we have the whole issue of bishops accused under the Vos Estes legislation. How are those being handled? Mm -hmm. In essence, I think uh, Father Zollner's frustrations are fair and good uh, because you need the system as it is now is much better than it was, but it's still not a system of public accountability with well, checks and balances that the average person knows about. Yeah, and Father and Bob, I'll give you a chance to chime in on this. I mean, the, on the paper, uh, the Holy Father has really closed the loop in so many areas of the sexual, sexual abuse crisis. On the other hand, the prosecutions and the follow-through have been sluggish. And that seems to be what Father uh, Zollner here is kind of in intimating at a distance and in some very vague language. Yeah, one of the cases that's been brought up, of course, is the Marco Rupnik case in, with regard to Father Zollner. There, he's a, a Jesuit as well, Father Zollner. Mm -hmm. And um, well, although you're right to say, <laughs> Raymond, that it's a bit hard to know exactly what he's talking about, because as you read through his statement, you were looking for him to point to something specific, and he just made these large statements about transparency, accountability, financial accountability, um, you know, the, the relationship between the different offices. And you can't help but think about this Marco Rupnik case, which is an egregious case of what I think has to be regarded as virtual sacrilege in the way that he used sex to seduce women and then used holy vessels and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And yet, no one wanted to take responsibility for him. The Holy Father said he didn't enter into it. The Jesuits didn't seem to think that they, uh, they, they had to do something about it. So it may be that it's issues like that. I mean, that's a very visible one, but there must be a lot of other cases 
where he just feels like mm. the institutional processes that allegedly are supposed to deal with, with these situations just aren't there. And so as Maybe it's just kind of a gentlemanly way for him not to point fingers at anybody in particular, but it looks like he's he's virtually accusing the entire structure that's been set up as, yeah. as being inadequate to the task. Mm. Uh, Father Jerry, I'll give you the last word real fast. Yeah, no, that the Zollner case, excuse me, the Rupnik case is precisely in the background of this. I mean, here we have an egregious case of horrible sex crimes by a priest, and this man is still functioning. Uh, the average person can understand it. I certainly don't. Mm. Okay, I want to move on. Uh, Cardinal Arthur Roche, he's the prefect for the Congregation for Divine Worship. He appeared on BBC Radio, and he was trying to defend the restrictions on the traditional Latin Mass. I want you all to listen to this. You know, the theology of the Church has changed, whereas before the priests represented at a distance all the people. They were channeled, as it were, through this person who alone was celebrating the Mass. It is not only the priest who celebrates the liturgy, but also those who are baptized with him. And that is an enormous statement to make. Uh, Bob, has the theology of the Church changed? I mean, that's what he said there. I'll read the quote. You know, the theology of the Church has changed. Has the theology of the Church changed vis-a-vis -vis the liturgy or anything else, frankly? Yeah, I'm not an expert on, on liturgy, so I can't pronounce too much about this, but people who are that I consulted about that statement claim that there are documents, and they, they cite those documents, that actually state that prior to Vatican II and the alleged change in the theology of the Church, that in fact the Church, the church had pronounced that, that the, the, the laity, the, the congregation, together with the Pope, we're, we're presenting the sacrifice of the Mass. So I think just in, a factual, in factual terms, that's incorrect. I don't believe that, that uh, uh, Cardinal Roach can make such a sweeping statement about ch changing the theology of the Church. And even if there is a change in the theology, is it the case that the traditional Latin Mass cannot be regarded as itself mm -hmm. Um, the, the combination of the priest and the laity pr making the, the, presenting the holy sacrifice of the mass. It just seems to me to be a non sequitur. It, it has nothing to do with whether the, the uh, traditional Latin mass should be curtailed or not. It's just how it's going to be understood. Yeah, well, uh, and Father Jerry, that's a great point. I mean, when I interviewed Benedict the, the 16th, he told me when in the old rite, it was a beautiful thing because you had both the priest and the congregation together facing God and offering worship up to God, that it was ontologically correct in some ways. Um, one could make the argument that the Novus Ordo, with the priest facing the people, they're offering to each other instead of off up to God. But um, your thoughts on that justification, as well as these bills, these ads that popped up all over Rome this week, urging the Holy Father to reverse course on his restrictions restrictions of the Latin Mass. We'll put some of those up on the screen. Sure. Well, to the first point, in both the Old and the New Mass, the priest says, pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God the Almighty Father. Mm. The priest offers a sacrifice in the person of Christ, and the laity associate their spiritual sacrifices with that offering. So there's a complete distinction there. The, the people do not celebrate the Mass. They're not celebrants offering the holy sacrifice. The theology has not changed. I'm sorry that the cardinal said that. And to say that the old mass, the priest, was at a distance from the people, is he talking spatial difference? Certainly not great difference in grace, because, you know, the holiest layman in the church could be much closer to God than the priest. That's invisible. Mm. But we're all united in the in mystical body of Christ. Regarding the billboards, you know, people are frustrated that Pope Francis, who does not really like the Latin mass and said that people shouldn't really go to it, uh, that he's kind of cracking down in a way that is really unfair, and then they're fighting back with publicity. So um, it, it, you can't have this seesaw in the church where one pope says the, the, the traditional mass is good, the next one says we've got to basically eliminate it. This isn't how we should be operating. What has been tolerated yeah. in the past under John Paul II and Benedict should continue to be tolerated, and, in, and I even say favored because it has so many benefits for the church.
You know, you know, during my during my book tour, someone stopped me and said, um, "Thank you for covering, you know, this this restriction of the of the Latin Mass." And uh, they said, "But we're so confused." And of course, they're confused, Father, because you you had the last two pontificates, and frankly, the woman who founded this network, who said, "There's beauty in the Latin, there's beauty in the eternal Mass, and we should reverence that and include." The, the mass that came from Vatican II, but both can live together and we can all be in harmony. Now, for us to then say, well, that's all wrong, well, were those people heretics? Were they liars? Did they deceive us? That's the challenge. That's the challenge for everybody, not just me. I don't matter all that much, frankly, and neither do, do we. We're just talking about this and asking questions. That's not a threat. Asking questions is a good thing. I thought dialogue and accompaniment were good things, too. But these people deserve accompaniment and dialogue. And I think they don't get it. They just get edicts and shut up and go away and get out of the parish. We don't even want to see you. But I, I worry about this new narrative that somehow since Vatican II, theology has changed and the old mass was a dirty and bad thing. We can talk about that more later. I guess I could go on for an afternoon. I'll stop. Uh, in an interview published on Monday with a uh, Croatian Catholic weekly, Luxembourg Cardinal Jean-Claude Hollerich, this, by the way, a top advisor to the pope, and he is the man responsible for shaping and leading the ongoing synod on synodality. So this is no small figure. He said this about the ordination of women. I'm going to read this. I am a promoter of giving women, women more pastoral responsibility. And if we achieve that, then we can perhaps see if there is still is a desire among women for ordination. For the moment, if Pope Francis tells me it is not an option, it is not an option. When asked if a future pope could rule against John Paul II's 1994 apostolic letter, uh, which stated that the Catholic Church does not have the authority to ordain women, Hollerich said it was possible and that, quote, the Church's teaching could be developed. <laughs> Father Jerry, uh, this cardinal seems to be placing a lot of emphasis and weight on obeying the pope. But Pope John Paul II, you know, he didn't issue his personal opinion in that apostolic letter. This was reaffirming the eternal teaching of the apostles, was it not? Yeah, it's a solemn teaching of the church that only males can be ordained, baptized males can be ordained priests, because that's the will of Christ as expressed in what he did at the Last Supper. To say opposite is a heretical statement. It, and it would be invalid to ordain a woman a priest. The canon law reflects that. In fact, it's a canonical offense to do that uh, with an automatic excommunication. Cardinal Hollerich is doing exactly what we were afraid of was going to happen with this synod on synodality being turned into a free-for-all. Mm -hmm. It's as if you're going down to the marketplace and saying, hey, everybody, buy whatever you want. We're going to pay for it, and everybody goes home happy. Uh, this isn't the church. The Catholic Church was founded by Jesus Christ with doctrines and practices that don't change when the calendar changes. So Cardinal Holler has done something very gravely damaging to the unity of the church, and I hope the Holy Father will rebuke him, because this is to tell women you should be ordained priests because that's a good thing. That is a completely un-Catholic way of dealing with this question. Yeah, Bob, he, he also, you know, he says, well, if women feel they should be ordained, if there's still a desire for ordination, you know, may, maybe Monty Hall, I mean, it's a shame he's gone. We could bring him back. We could do let's make a deal at the Vatican come October. It's like everybody's throwing their, their little wish list out. This stuff just, either the church permits it or it doesn't. It's the church of Christ. Either he allowed it and the apostles allowed it or they didn't. This isn't make it up as you go. That's a different church, but it's not this one. Bob, I'll... Be quiet. Yeah, you know, I, I think that uh, the larger context for this, I mean, Hol Hollerich has also spoken about revising teaching on sexual morality, homosexuality, etc. Um, I don't know that he's touched marriage and divorce, but he's probably on board with a more extreme interpretation of Amoris Laetitia. This is exactly what's been happening in the, in the German, German Synod, and it could not be more striking the way that the Vatican um, authorities uh, like Cardinal Parolin and, and others, have spoken to the Germans and, and said, you can't do this, you can't do that, but we're happy to be in dialogue. Meanwhile, you have a cardinal like mm -hmm. Cardinal Roach who looks at the people if, of the TLM who, by and large, are quite harmless, pious people, and just says, absolutely no, this is wrong, this is a... This is a, a, an ancient way to look at things, and the church has changed. On the one hand, we have, have this indulgent dialogue of stuff that has never been accepted in the church. And on the other hand, we have this extremely 
I would say even cruel approach to people who are just doing what the, doing a liturgy that has always been a part of the church until the last 50 years. It's a stark contrast, and it goes to the heart of what you're talking about, Raymond, that in some sense, uh, there's a way that these people think that, that everything is negotiable in one direction, but it's absolutely shut off in the other direction. No, the past is dead, and it needs to be crucified and buried. I mean, that's sort of the mindset. But the great future, what's on the horizon, what the synod is whispering in our ears, what the Spirit will tell us tomorrow, that that somehow is, is uh, sacrosanct. It make, it's very confusing, I have to say. Uh, Father Hollerick, Cardinal Hollerick continued, he said that, uh, the church should not refer to LGBT people as intrinsically disordered, and that the demands of celibacy should not be placed upon them. Here's what he said. For some of them, it is possible to be chaste, but calling others to chastity seems like speaking Egyptian to them. We can only charge people with moral conduct they can bear in the world. If we ask impossible things from them, we will put them off. And if we say everything they do is intrinsically wrong, it's like saying their life has no value. Father Jerry, your reaction? Well, where to start, Raymond? Uh, he, he completely misses uh, the Catholic truth on this. God's law is not impossible to observe. So God's law forbidding sodomy is not impossible for anyone to observe. You simply refrain from doing that evil act. Uh, he uses the LGBT language. Uh, homosexuals, uh, transsexuals, bisexuals. The Catholic Church doesn't believe that there's such a thing as transsexuals or bisexuals. You have heterosexual people who engage in deviant behavior. This is sexual immorality. He's saying that the Catholic Church has to look upon this as an ordered use of sexuality. Now, the Catechism says that homosexual acts are intrinsically disordered, meaning it's a misuse of the body in a way not intended by God, and that's revealed both in Revelation and in nature. So we know what sex is all about. And in fact, in the 21st century, we know too much in terms of what's on, on the screens. <laughs> and now he's turning around and telling us, guess what, folks? All of Catholic history is wrong. Homosexual behavior is good. It's completely, perfectly ordered according to God's will. And we have to be accepting of this. And then to tell people, not, sin is not sin, and you're not expected to follow ancient rules, this is destructive. Why is this man as a cardinal doing this? Doesn't he understand he's a subversive? If he doesn't believe the teaching, he should resign his office and leave, because this is not how Catholic cardinals are supposed to behave themselves. I, if I'm angry, yeah, it's look, because forget, I am. Let's, and I think a lot of people are angry. Yeah, uh, I agree. Yeah, I, I look, I, I just think people just want to know what they're signing up for, Father. And, uh, I, you know, I had a convert come up to me and say, everything seems to be changing. Everything I love and want to come into the church for doesn't seem to be there anymore. That's a hard thing to have to listen to as a lifelong Catholic. Um, but, you know, let's put the Catholic Church aside and cardinals aside. Jesus Christ himself, we just had the reading. He goes to the woman at the well. He, he tells her what her sin is, her, her sexual sin. He forgives her, and he says, go and sin no more. Repent. That is the message at the heart of Catholic teaching. So you can't make it up after that. That is the model. You just have to follow that. And, and uh, I'm going to read this, too. This is, Bob, I'll get your take on this. Um, there's a recent interview the Pope gave with an Argentinian daily, uh, La Nación. And uh, Pope Francis spoke specifically about the tw his 2018 apostolic constitution, which established new canonical norms for the Synod of Bishops, opening the door for laity to vote. Okay? When asked if women should be voting in the Synod of Bishops on Synodality, Pope Francis said the following, everyone who is a participant in the Synod is going to vote. He or she who is a guest or an observer is not going to vote. Whoever participates in the synod has a right to vote, be it a man or a woman. All, all. This word, all, is key for me. Um, Bob, your take on this. I know Father Jerry wrote a piece in the Catholic thing about it last week, but your reaction. Well, yes, if you want the first and last word about this, you have to read uh, Father Murray, who says we, we've got this revolution where we used to have a synod of bishops, and even that word bishop is dropped out of, out of certain... Uh, logos and, and websites and whatnot that are, are related. Look, it's, it's part and parcel of this general thing that you've been trying to get at, Raymond, of where everything seems to be melting down into, into everything else. And what we've, we've seen over the last 50 or 60 years, in particular with the, with, with the uh, loosening of, 
of strictures about extramarital sex is we, we see what's happened to the society as a whole. We have a disaster, disastrous um, uh, percentage of divorces, of, of single parenting, of children with psychological and drug and alcohol problems as, as a result of this. You know, our faith is a, I like to say that we have a binary God. We don't have a non-binary God. We have uh, male and female, he created them. You know, the man leaves his, his, uh, his family and the man and the woman become one. That is the, the basic vision of the human person that exists in, uh, in uh, Catholicism. And the, the various things that, that are being proposed by people at the very highest levels of the church these days seem to want to go back and contradict everything from the very beginning. I, I've said this over and over again, but I don't get ever get tired of this. If the church has been wrong about male and female, he created them. And there are plenty of people over the last 50 or 60 years who want to dispute that. Well, then virtually everything that we, we have in the Bible and, and tradition is, is up for grabs. And it's not surprising that, that almost everything uh, outside of even sexual matters can now be considered you know, to, to be on the verge of being changed. So women voting in a synod of bishops, which is no longer a synod of bishops, I say again, go read Father Murray, but it's hardly a surprise. Yeah, Father, what happened to the synod of bishops? I mean, is this the end of an actual synod of bishops? And does canon law say anything about who can vote in a synod of bishops? Well, you know, canon law basically said up till now, until the Pope just changed it, that those who vote at the synod are the bishops or selected priests who belong to religious orders who exercise a certain jurisdiction over their members. Uh, but the, the priests and bishops uh, are ordained, uh, receive holy orders, and they're conformed to Christ sacramentally, Christ the high priest. So the role of the priest uh, is not simply to offer the sacraments, but also to govern and to teach. So a synod is a, is a gathering of the high priests of the church. The bishop is a high priest in his diocese, and he's meant to teach, govern, and sanctify them in union with the other bishops and to advise the pope on how to do it. Once lay people are introduced into this, now we have a political assembly. And I'd like to know who's going to pick the lay people, what are their qualifications, why are they there, how many will they be, what's the percentage. It, now this becomes like an Anglican, you know, general assembly. Or they, they have these meetings every five years. They have the House of Clergy, House of Laity, and it becomes yeah. a political game. We don't need this. We know what we need to do in the Catholic Church, which is to teach the faith not monkey around by telling women you're second-class citizens if you can't vote at a synod of bishops. That, is, that, that has nothing to do with the nature of the church. Now, yeah. you, know, you know what, uh, uh, I mean, those who are on the other side of this, Father, will say you're being very clerical. You're trying to keep the laity out of this process. But, uh, uh, but I think if one stands back and looks, you have to realize that we all have our roles in society. Clerics shouldn't be trumping on lay roles, speaking out in public and, and affecting the natural order in society. And similarly, laity should not be running into the altar and trying to edge the priest out and do his job. Everybody has their role. It's the nature of the world, nature and life. So, um, but yeah, I, I, this, is, this is a Pandora's box, guys. I mean, you know, the, the, I, I, I'm bracing myself for... October, and I need a reservation at a bar, I think, regularly, so I can try to soothe myself in between. Um, gentlemen, I want to move on. Uh, the Pope spoke at a conference organized by a theological uh, academy, and during his address, he spoke about the future of moral theology. I want to read this quote to you. Uh, he said, the Second Vatican Council states that moral theology nourished by sacred scripture must help the faithful to understand the greatness of their vocation to bring the charity of Christ into the world, not a cold desktop morality. The proposal they seek to offer instead responds to a pastoral discernment charged with merciful love, aimed at understanding, forgiving, accompanying, and above all, Integrating. Now, the Pope then discussed conscience, and he cited a father, Bernard Harrig, uh, who wrote a book called Free and Faithful in Christ. Uh, father Herring was a very controversial moral theologian who taught at this academy the Pope was speaking for, or at. Um, and, and, and here's what he said. The word that is conscience speaks is not its own, but comes from the very word of the Creator, who became flesh to be with men. 
And it is at his school, at the School of the Incarnate Word, that each one learns to dialogue with others, cultivating the aspiration for a universal fraternity rooted in the recognition of the inviolable dignity of every person. Uh, I, I got to tell you, I, I'm, I, I hesitate to even inflict my audience with these quotes, because frankly, I can't make heads or tails of it, even as I read it. It's, it's gobbledygook. But what do you make of the Pope invoking a figure like Herring, Father Jerry? Well, this is very troubling. Bernard Herring was a dissenter. He rejected Humanae Vitae. He rejected the Church's teaching on divorce and remarriage. Uh, when John Paul II came out with Veritatis Splendor, he rejected that. Bernard Herring was part of the reason why moral theology was in such chaos following the Second Vatican Council. Uh, now, to characterize mm. uh, moral theology as taught in the history of church as cold, desktop morality, it's a caricature. It's not what it is. The Ten Commandments are both divine and human, meaning they are God's law meant to shape human life to seek happiness in this world and the next. So to, you know, explicate the meaning of the Ten Commandments, uh, which the church has done throughout history, that's the most human and divine thing that you can do. Uh, the notion of cheap forgiveness, which sometimes this happens with this notion of accompaniment. In other words, you walk with someone as they're committing sins, but you don't tell them they're sinful because you don't want to get them upset. Uh, that's not the way we should do things. Uh, I really I regret that the moral theology of the church is being you know, reintroduced to Bernard Herring. Uh, no, we need to be reintroduced to Veritatis Splendor and the teaching of John Paul II. Hmm. Now, Bob, do you want to add anything before we move on? Yeah, yeah, as you know, I, I wrote a 600-plus page book about uh, the Catholic intellectual tradition in the 20th century. And when I was doing it, mm. it actually, I remember at one point I was trying to decide whether to include Bernard Herring, Father Bernard Herring, in that book. And I decided, no, that stuff is just gone. It will never uh, come back. And as Father said, <laughs> there were a number of ways in which he was an obvious dissenter. And unfortunately, for some reason, the Holy Father has gotten this impression through Herring and others, he said when he was studying that uh, you couldn't read Herring because he's a heretic. And back in those days, if you left one candle off the altar, it was a venial sin. And if you left two, it was a mortal sin. As if th there was this crude, ridiculous way of, of regarding things as sins and, and, and doing moral analysis. That's not at all what the church has ever been. And anybody who reads into it knows that the technical matters are, are very important. We need to have truth, as, as Benedict mm -hmm. XVI said over and over again. You can't be pastoral without the truth. What are you going to be pastoral about if you don't have the truth? Right. But we've brought back this, you know, th this uh, half-hearted idea of of morality, where it's too hard for young people to remain faithful and to not divorce. It's too hard not to concept. In other words, it's too hard to follow God. We know it's hard. But it's not impossible, mm -hmm. and the church shouldn't put itself in the position of kind of offering, you know, half apologies, half excuses for the weaknesses. And half truths. The, and half truths for the weaknesses and the, the self deceptions that we all have. Yeah. I, I want to show people something, and I, I grappled with whether to share this with the audience because it is so uh, horrible in some ways. Um, but I do think it's revealing. You know, Benedict used to say the church, it prays as it lives. You know, it, it, whatever you believe, ex it externalizes itself in the way the liturgy presents itself. Well, uh, in Germany, the Synodal Way is continuing on, and they hosted a performance at the Frankfurt Cathedral, the cathedral, at the conclusion of the German Synodal Way earlier this month. Participants in the final assembly overwhelmingly endorsed a document that uh, called on the bishops to permit blessings for same-sex unions. And then they put on this performance, which uh, is allegedly to depict the horrors of sexual abuse. Uh, this is in the cathedral at Frankfurt. Just look at this. Now, um, uh, yeah, I hesitate to show you any more of this. I'm, uh, yeah, I think that's plenty. But uh, one bishop called the performance satanic. Uh, Father Jerry, your critique. Um, we are seeing the self-destruction of the Catholic Church in Germany being carried out by its shepherds. Uh, here we are paying actors to perform uh, something that shouldn't be seen 
in a church by any means. Avant-garde theater, this costs hundreds of thousands of euros, I'm sure. It's designed to desacralize not simply the building, but also people's sensitivities. You go into a church, which is called the House of God, in order to pray. And what, they're, what they've created this is this dark, evil sense of self-indulgent uh, theater to express, you know, whatever they want to express. That's not what a church is all about. And the doctrinal mm -hmm. chaos is seen in this artistic chaos. I I'm truly disgusted mm -hmm. that the German hierarchy, with all their money, are using it to do things like this. If they were so concerned about victims, take that money they used, they should have given it to a, you know, a victim's organization that's helping people who are abused by priests. Yeah, I agree. The, these kind of, the, the church is not a performance space. And, you know, and, and, and if you're going to use it as a performance space, do something better than, you know, avant-garde Sweeney Todd. This is like macabre, grand gugnol. I've never seen anything like it. Um, Bob, I want to throw this to you. Uh, Bishop Heimer Wilmer, who's a proponent of the German Synodal Way, uh, he recently published a letter to his diocese, okay, in Germany. He said the following, it has become clear that we need significant changes in the sexual morality in the Catholic Church. I welcome the fact that the Synodal Way is in favor of establishing a working group to develop a manual for blessing celebrations of same-sex couples as well as remarried divorcees. Your reaction to this letter? Yeah, I, I really think this is a letter that anybody who wants to understand not only what's happening in the German synodal way, but what, it, what is likely to happen in the synod on synodality globally, you ought to pay some careful attention to this. Because what he does is he really raises the stakes on the, um, the, the, what, what, what is happening in refusing to go along with this radical redefinition of, of Catholicism. At one point, he talks about how back in the fall when um, you know, the, the, the bishops in Germany voted on some of these radical proposals with a secret ballot and did not reach the two-thirds that they needed to pass them. So then what, what happened is they, they changed the rules, and now you had to vote openly, and suddenly some of the people who were more, uh, let's say it frankly, cowardly and wouldn't vote in, in public the way they had voted in private passed it. Before that happened, though, he said there were people mm. who were screaming and crying, and one woman collapsed in a corner, and she had been the victim of, 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 of abuse. I mean, there, there's this attempt to cater to people who are absolutely hysterical about the presentation of Catholicism. And you cannot run any organization, let alone a, a, a organization, an institution like the church, which is dedicated to... To, to the universal holiness of all its people by caving into people who get hysterical about things that don't go their own way. I think that that this is probably the heart of what we're going to see. We're going to be talked. We're going to be told about mm -hmm. compassion, about people suffering. He actually says in that letter, "Did this, the German synodal way fail people like this who grew hysterical?" Well, if we're going to always base our final decisions on the most hysterical people in society, we, we can just imagine what our church is going to turn into. Yeah. Well, thank goodness Jesus didn't put his teachings or himself up to a pole. Actually, he did, and they put him on a pole. They crucified him on Good Friday. Um, I, I think the church is in, in terrible straits if it moves down that path, uh, you know, and thinks they can just suddenly uh, accommodate the world. Accompanying the world will lead nowhere good. Uh, Father, uh, before we leave Bishop Wilmer here, uh, th this German bishop who just issued this letter. There is a rumor in Rome that he is set to succeed Cardinal Luis Ladaria, who's the uh, head of the dicastery uh, of the doctrine of the faith. Um, and Roman sources tell me, and, and it's been reported in some places, that that still remains a possibility after being blocked by concerned cardinals. Let's hope it's not going to happen. And if the Pope, after this letter has been published, if the Pope were to go ahead and appoint this man, it would be a sign from the Pope that he doesn't care that the person that he would be putting in charge of the doctrine of the faith rejects the doctrine of the faith. Uh, we have to hope and pray that this is not going to happen. I heard those same reports that he was scheduled mm -hmm. to be named the head of the doctrine of the faith, and it was, you know, it didn't happen, but it's still a possibility. I would say with, with all... Uh, the energy that I can raise as a Catholic priest uh, to the Holy Father, please do not inflict upon the church the doubts and denials of the faith that this bishop is putting forward. In fact, I would say to the Pope, 
please tell this bishop to recant his errors or resign or be removed as bishop where he is because imagine the fate of the people in his diocese. People struggling with sin and doubt and they have a shepherd who says, go ahead and sin and don't, don't worry about doubts. Uh, this is a disaster. Uh, this man should not be a Catholic bishop unless he recants. Uh, I want to move on to five Nordic bishops who are now speaking out. They issued a letter reaffirming traditional Christian teaching on sexuality. The letter released on Saturday, signed by eight members of the Nordic uh, Bishops' Conference, states the following. Uh, now notions of what it is to be human and so a sexual being are in flux. What is taken for granted today may be rejected tomorrow. Let us then try to appropriate the fundamental principles of Christian anthropology while reaching out in friendship with respect to those who feel estranged by them. Our mission and task as bishops is to point toward the peaceful, life-giving path of Christ's commandments, narrow at the outset, but growing broader as we advance. We would let you down if we offered less. We are not ordained to preach little notions of our own. Um, Bob, how do you see this playing out at the Synod of Bishops on Synodality? I mean, will these voices be heard? Well, I mean, first of all, isn't it astonishing that we usually think of Scandinavia as this, <laughs> you know, this yeah. cold atheist uh, place that is it's a part of the fur furthest from Christianity in Europe. And in fact, these bishops who find themselves in those societies and realize what's at stake put together, I think, what is an absolutely beautiful letter. Again, I would say to anybody watching, it's three and a half pages mm -hmm. long. I would read it very, very carefully. When they say that we don't, you know, we are not here to, to present our own little ideas, but to give people the larger perspective, I, I'm a little bit I put off when people use the term anthropology because it gives people in the English-speaking world a sense of, you know, people digging up bones and, and trying to establish, yeah. you know, the, the, the scent of species or whatever. But they're right that anthropology in this sense means what are human beings like? And one of the, the great insights they have is we're now pre preaching to children as if the, this current madness over transgenderism and LGBT, et cetera, we're, we're preaching to them as if this is an established scientific fact when it's not. And that we're allowing children who are not old enough to make decisions like these to, to make life altering decisions that, you know, we live in a society where adults, unfortunately, are going to be able to do whatever they want. But certainly, we, sh we shouldn't have children in certain places, certain jurisdictions in the United States are now trying to say we should not have people before the age of 18 getting puberty blockers or tes testosterone or having, you know, radical gender surgeries. Kids are, are not allowed to vote. They're not allowed to drink. They're not allowed to smoke cigarettes up until the age of 18 mm -hmm. in most jurisdictions. Why is it that we enable them to, to take this radical step based on a crazy uh, uh, sexual ideology. I think it's an, a very encouraging letter. Whether any other bishops will be inclined to follow it, I don't know. But I think any any sane person is going to look at that and say, that is the real way forward, not this acceptance of the madness that we see all around us that is not even helpful for the people who think that they want that madness as, as a way of feeling better. You know, Father Jerry, so many of these stories touch on the same rail. And that rail runs right into the Synod on Synodality. And you still get the feeling that people are trying to carve out territory and put their bets on one color, and then you get a responding group of bishops or cardinals from another country trying to counter it and say, no, 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 let's stand with the traditional teaching. Uh, is this the kind of uh, clerical blood sport that we can expect to see? moving into October. I mean, someone, you know, a, a priest the other day, a very esteemed priest, actually, um, I ran into him and he said, this is shaping up to be Heresy Con 2023. Um, your thoughts on what we're going to be looking for here, and is this just how it's going to play out? Everybody throwing out their idea and wishes, and it's just going to be a brawl. Uh, there's going to be a lot of fighting going on. It won't just be in the Synod Hall. It'll also be out on the sidewalks and the streets, meaning there are going to be disputes and debates and all. And essentially, this is a political process uh, in which people who favor one thing are in charge of the process, and they promote all kinds of bad ideas, heretical ideas, moral ideas. And then we're supposed to sit there and say, I guess this is what we need to be talking about. Uh, this is not at all what we need to be talking about. 
I look forward to reading contributions from African bishops, from bishops in Asia. Uh, you know, I'd like to know what South American bishops are going to say. I don't really care anymore after what's happened in Germany uh, what the German bishops say because they are teaching error to their people, and we don't want any more of that. It's remarkable. Um, you know, as a Catholic priest here in New York City, I went to the synodal meeting uh, that we had for our area, and largely the concerns were how can we make our parishes more vibrant? Well, I guarantee that's not going to be the first topic at the Synod in Rome. The basic topic is going to be we want to ordain women deacons and then maybe priests. We want divorce and remarry Catholics to have free access to the sacraments. We want to affirm homosexual lifestyle as something that's good and should be blessed. It's going to go on and on from there. And we want priests to be able to get married. And where, where does this end? This is nothing but the 60s liberal agenda being served up as if this is the Holy Spirit's movement in the church. It is not. This is a, a sad to say, and I'm, I most regret this, this is a huge waste of time, but worse than that, it's disorienting the faithful. So uh, I'm not looking forward mm -hmm. to October, but uh, unless things change, this is where it's going. Hmm. I want to move on to uh, a recent interview that Cardinal uh, McElroy of San Diego, Robert McElroy, uh, recently offered to a Spanish language publication. And he criticized EWTN when asked about the decision of a newly installed bishop in Spain to ban diocesan television from carrying content from this network. McElroy said, quote, I would not have EWTN on diocesan media either. EWTN worries me because it represents a giant of economic and cultural power connected to a religious viewpoint that's fundamentally critical of the Pope. The main anchors of the channel constantly minimize the abilities and theological knowledge of Francis, cite Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano's slander of the Pope, and try to move the world away from the reforms the Pope is signaling. Bob, I'll give you the first crack at this. Is that us? I, I, I didn't recognize us in all that. I thought we were all trying to make no. comments that actually help move the church along in a, in, in a good way. Look, there have been uh, publications like the National Catholic Reporter, just to take one, that have been heterodox for years and years and years, criticized John Paul in pretty nasty ways, criticized Benedict when he died in rather nasty ways as well. And no one has ever mm -hmm. thought that these publications should not be uh, available in various dioceses. I, I really think that if you want to talk about people leading astray and, and introducing division into the church, those kinds of things are far more damaging than anything that EWTN has, has ever done. But it's it's curious that we have been described, and I'm assuming that this this particular segment of EWTN is part of that that criticism. We've been described in in these. I think unfair ways when we, we've tried to be respectful of the Pope, we praise him when he does things that are good, and we're trying to warn him about something that he started. You know, one of his principles over the years has been you don't occupy spaces. In other words, you don't dominate a situation. You begin processes and let them let them uh, play out and, and, and see where the Holy Spirit's going to lead us. We can start to see, as Father was saying so eloquently just a little while ago, where this process of synodality is going. It is not going to be a renewal of the church. I think that within the next couple of years, we're going to see far greater confusion, far greater conflict within the church, and that is going to be helpful to absolutely no one. I, I, look, I, I would like to engage Cardinal McElroy in some sort of dialogue, but he'd have to really look at what it is that we've been trying to do and recognize that we have some legitimate concerns that don't, that aren't just a personal critique of the Holy Father, that are legitimate concerns of Catholics trying to follow, follow Jesus Christ. Yeah, and stay in the church. Father Jerry, uh, your reaction to that critique or broadside? Sure. Do I... The broad side, it's basically making an ad hominem attack against the hosts on EWTN and guests such as ourselves. I'm, I'm pretty convinced that's what he's talking about and others. Uh, ad hominem attacks are, are not worth responding to because they're basically characterizing the arguments that people make as not worth listening to since they're essentially not people you need to listen to. Uh, what we do here and what I try to do in my writing on TV is to guide people when they are confused about things coming out of all different domains, including Rome. For instance, Cardinal McElroy in that interview, he said the Catechism of the Catholic Church should be changed because to describe homosexual acts as intrinsically disordered is wrong. It's a philosophical way of dealing things. It's not right. No, Cardinal McElroy is wrong. The Church put that into the Catechism because it's the truth. 
you know, Pope Francis has said the state should grant uh, civil unions for homosexuals. John Paul II said the exact opposite. So to comment and bring these things up is not to attack the pope. It's to try to say, look, Holy Father, look, Cardinal McElroy, the teaching of the church is a gift from God. We're all supposed to defend it. I didn't go to the seminary so that I'd be ignorant. I went there to learn, and I learned a lot, and I want to share it with you and our listeners. So I don't accept this approach. When he says he's going to ban EWTN products in his diocese, who's benefiting from that? Is this how you have a dialogue in the church? Is this the adult way of Christianity? Not at all. This is, I have, I have to say, it's not a nice way of dealing with people that you disagree with. You should really engage their arguments, not caricaturize them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, look, and, and we, we should say, I think the big challenge, the big problem here is we are daring to ask informed questions and offer informed commentary and context. That becomes a danger in a time when people are trying to remake the future by recasting the past. And that is really, look, when we founded this organization, when EWTN News was founded by Mother Angelica and she asked me to come aboard here and found it with her, one of the watchwords was, you follow the truth wherever it leads. And it's not always going to be comfortable stating the truth nor enunciating it to a wide audience. I think people are threatened by that truth and secondarily by the voice that it gives to the people who have no voice. Um, mainly this audience. So, um, with all due respect, um, we're going to keep doing what we're doing uh, for as long as we can, because I think the truth is worth it, even if it's uncomfortable and, frankly, difficult at times. Difficult. Um, at an event hosted at Georgetown University, at the Center for Faith and Justice, believe it or not, uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi, former Speaker Nancy Pelosi, addressed her home bishop, Archbishop Salvatore Cordelion, who banned her from receiving communion because of her stance on abortion. Here's what she said. I have a problem with my archbishop, and I figure that's his problem, not mine. <laughs> Father Jerry, uh, is this Archbishop Cordelion's problem? And where are the other cardinals? even on the West Coast, saying, wait a minute, Nancy, you're out of line. You shouldn't be appearing in people's dioceses anymore, banned from the dioceses for disobeying your bishop. Uh, this is ridiculous. To say the bishop has a problem for defending Catholic doctrine, for defending the holiness of the Holy Eucharist, for calling her to repent, if she thinks that God is pleased by her promotion of abortion, she is totally wrong. If she doesn't believe that now, we have to keep pounding it into her head, metaphorically speaking, by, competing, by repeating it at every possible occasion. Nancy Pelosi is responsible for grave evil in society by promoting abortion. And her bishop is a hero, uh, Bishop Archbishop Cor Leone, for defending Catholic truth. That's, that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. Bob, I'll give you a crack at that. Yeah, you know, we thought that people like Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden were, were politicians and that that's what that, that is the career path that they chose. But we we didn't know that they were actually theologians because Nancy has told us she studied the issue <laughs> and the archbishop is wrong. I mean, he's actually has theological training, but he's wrong. Joe Biden, of course, as we know, just said the other day that the, the, the way that people are opposing the LGBT agenda and, and the trans agenda is almost a sin. Well, I mean, he's, I, I guess he's getting very strict in his morality in, in, in his old age because suddenly he's discovered something that he thinks is, is like a, a public sin. Look, these are politicians who do what politicians do. They try to keep coalitions together. They try to get votes. That's what they're primarily concerned about and, frankly, holding power. And yet they've presented themselves mm -hmm. as, as if they have some understanding of the faith well beyond what the people who actually have the, the office and the responsibility of teaching, governing, and sanctifying the people of God are doing. Joe Biden refers to the Holy Father as his close friend. I don't know that Francis is, is happy about the way that he does that, but they're, they're actually pushing a line that is, is a deception, that they know something about the faith that our, our bishops and maybe even our pope don't know. It would be laughable in any other period, and yet because of the, the, the state of our country at, at this moment, they get away with it. Yeah. Uh, I want to move on a media outlet supportive of the dictatorship of Daniel Ortega down in Nicaragua has posted video of Bishop Rolando Alvarez. Now, the video shows him sharing a meal with his brother and sister during a visit to the prison 
where he has been sentenced for 26 years um, for uh, basically being a traitor to the homeland, opposing Noriega. Uh, when asked about how he's doing by an off-camera interviewer, the bishop replied, Thanks be to God, I'm well, with a lot of inner strength, with a lot of peace in the Lord and the Most Holy Virgin. Pope Francis has expressed concern for the bishop and has offered prayers for him and his country. Should the Vatican be doing more to help this bishop, who is obviously another bishop, unjustly imprisoned? Uh, Father Jared. Well, you know, they just closed the nunciature in Nicaragua. Uh, the Holy See mm -hmm. has no diplomatic, active diplomatic relations there right now. The Pope has denounced this political scheme of imprisoning one of his bishops. Uh, you know, keep bringing it up, I would tell the Holy Father. It's, it's, or, or, Ortega is a tin pot dictator who is ruining, he's been ruining his country for years. He's continuing to do it. And a holy man who is a faith leader in his country, is now sitting in a prison because he makes Daniel Ortega feel uncomfortable. It shows how weak dictatorships are. Uh, and I applaud what that bishop said. That approach to accepting imprisonment is what Christ expects of us. And God bless him. Bob, you've covered this, uh, the, the martyrs in our church for years and years. Uh, your reaction when you saw this? Yeah, I, I mean, the, the corruption down there is so large. You know, there used to be a joke during the Cold War that the Ceausescu regime in Romania represented socialism within one family. The Ceausescu's whole family was running that country. Well, the Ortegas are doing right. the same thing. They've been representing themselves as Marxists and liberators for years and years and, and, and proponents of socialism. But uh, Daniel Ortega's wife, Rosaria, is the vice president. His children run the various large offices in the state. And here's a bishop who stands in and says some tough criticisms about the regime. But look, if you're, if, if you're open to uh, leading your people, you, you, you listen to that and you respond to it. And they, they gave him a, a sentence of over a quarter of a century for that. I think the only thing that we can do is places like this, in this show, then the Holy Father, and everywhere we keep repeating this, that this is not the way that any country in the Americas or in the entire world ought to be re treating religious, uh, religious leaders. Uh, the, the bishop I is a, her he's a hero. Let us just hope that at some point the, the international pressure about the regime in general has some effect. But t uh, tin pot dictators like this tend to resist international pressure. So let's pray for him and let's just hope for a good outcome. Well, we will leave it there on that hopeful note. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Commentary by Robert Royal and Father Gerald Murray is available at thecatholicthing.org. Thank you. And before we go, The Unexpected Light of Thomas Alva Edison, my first book in the Turnabout Tales series, is available at bookstores everywhere. It makes a wonderful Easter gift. Uh, in many ways, it's a story of resurrections and sacrifice in a family, and it tells the tale of how a challenging moment in the life of the world's greatest inventor helped him become the world's greatest inventor. I always say he should be the patron saint of homeschooling, and um, many of my readers agree. We will leave it there for now. Until next week, we will be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo. Bye now. Thank you.